بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So today إن شاء الله I want to demonstrate uh, with two examples you can say two study cases two examples of if you're reading a book of hadith what you read in the book of hadith and what we are taught of that interpretation can be very different and the difference between a muhaddith and a faqih a person who collects the narrations of the prophet sallallahu or the narrations of the companions of the prophet or those after them collects them his collecting those narrations does not give the explanation or the understanding rather or the depth of analysis that is necessary to come to the right conclusion. And so because the fuqaha came first in Islamic history, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Ahmed, Muhammad, Rahimahullah, they all came before the muhaddisin. Imam Bukhari, for example, came way after, almost 300 years after the Prophet So the people that, that formulated the rules of Islamic law, the fiqh, the deep understanding, by which the, then the texts would be understood. So let's look at some examples of that today. Okay, so let's look at two examples. The first one is taking back a gift. Taking back a gift. Now let me share with you what the Prophet ﷺ said. An Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma qala nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-a'idu fi hibbati the one who takes back his gift, kal kalbi yaqi'u, is like the dog that does qay, that vomits, thumma ya'udu fi qay'ihi, and then he returns back his vomit, meaning he takes back his vomit. So, for example, Imam Bukhari on this very issue, one of the fatwas, because when a muhaddis writes a chapter, and in fact, let me just uh, go back here and make sure that you have this in English too. The Prophet said, وسلم, the one who repossesses a gift, meaning after giving it, is like a dog which vomits and then returns its vomit. And this hadith and this version of the hadith is agreed upon. Muttafaqun alayh. Okay? There are two versions of this narration. This is the stronger version. The one who takes back his gift is like a dog which vomits and then returns its vomit. I'll mention the other version uh, in a little bit. Okay? So, Imam Bukhari, being a muhaddis, what does he say? لا يحل لأحد أن يرجع في حبته وصدقته لا يحل. It is not halal. It is not allowed. Li ahadin for anyone. An yarji' that he takes back fi hibbatihi. That he takes back his gift. Why? Because the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-a'idu fi hibbati. Okay? The one who takes back his hibba, his gift, is like the one, is like the dog that takes back its vomit. Okay? Now, how does this reasoning go? So now, if you only look at the hadith in which the Prophet gives a negation, a prohibition, don't, in the Prophet says, don't do something, don't take back the gift, it's like the dog taking back the vomit. So how does Abu Hanifa or the fuqaha, how did they understand this narration of the Prophet <coughs> They first say, well, the agreed upon text is that the one who takes back the vomit is like the dog that takes back its vomit. So, 
The first question is, if this is the authentic version of the narration, then, and by the way, this is, this narration is mentioned by multiple sources, multiple turuk, multiple uh, uh, chains from different cities who didn't know each other saying the same thing, including Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma. So, so, what do the fuqaha say? Now, so, some of you that read this probably in a book, the Prophet said, the one who takes back a gift is like the dog who takes back its vomit, would say, okay, there you go, the Prophet said it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We love the Prophet, and we want to hold on to the Prophet, and therefore it is wrong to take back your gift. That's the conclusion we should all reach to if we read the text. The faqih Abu Hanifa, Imam Al-A'zam, he says that the tamthil, the example the Prophet gave was of a dog taking back its vomit. Of a dog taking back its vomit. It is haram, it is najas for a mu'min, for a Muslim to take back its vomit, for a human being to take back its vomit is najas. Just like you can't drink blood. It's not just to take back your vomit. And those of you that know that if qay, if the vomit comes out a certain amount, like a fistful in Ramadan, and it, you swallow it back, your fasting is broken. So, Imam Abu Hanifa says, but for the dog to take back its vomit is not a prohibition of sharia for the dog. So therefore, it is not haram because it is allowed, it is disgusting. It is a disgusting act, but it is not against the, the law of sharia for a dog to take back its vomit. So, what do we understand? <coughs> this is one Part of what I'm trying to explain is that what you read in the text is not necessarily the understanding that the fuqaha have come to. So it's not only important to know what the text is saying, it is also important to know what the fuqaha have pondered over, reflected over. The second aspect is that they never look at things in isolation. So are there other traditions about hiba, about gifting? So we find yes. There are other narrations. So, for example, I will now show you. So, the Prophet said, وسلم, in the translation, it is not permissible for anyone to give a gift, then take it back, except a father, with regard to what he gives to his son. The likeness of the one who gives a gift and then takes it back is that of a dog, which eats it when it is full. And, uh, and then when he is full, it vomits and goes to it to take back its vomit. Okay, so the Prophet says, لا يحل لأحد أن يؤتي أطيع فيرجع فيها إلا والدي إلا والدة فيما أوتي ولده مثل الذي يؤتي الأطية فيرجع فيها ككل يأكل حتى إذا شبع قاء ثم يعود ثم عاد فيرجع في قيعه so, now you find a narration of the Prophet وسلم, talking about the same subject, but in this the Prophet gave an exception, which is that there is an exception that if a father gives something to his son as a gift, and then, the, like, for example, uh, the father gave his son uh, a gift, a screwdriver or a knife or a lawnmower, for example, and the father feels, wait, I need that lawnmower that I gave my son. The father has a right to then go take from back from the son. So, the, the fuqaha said, wait, this is not an absolute law. There are some exceptions. Then some fuqaha said, oh, because the father is allowed to do this, then other relatives who share or neighbor neighbors and relatives who on the same basis share from each other, this should be then it should be allowed for them too. Going against the literal meaning of the text. 
There's another narration of this sort that I would like to share with you. I'm just going to read from here the hadith of uh, Muwak. Okay, uh, they quoted as evidence for the words of Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu an, whoever gives a gift, okay, for the sake of ties of kinship or by way of charity, should not take it back. Whoever gives a gift thinking that he's seeking something in return, and then it is up to him whether he wants to take it back in the event that he's displeased with when he gets with what he gets in return. So in other words, the Umar bin Khattab is saying that if you give a gift to someone, you give something to someone, but there was an understanding between two people. I'm going to give you this and you're going to give me this. Or there was some understanding. I'll give you this gift. You be, uh, you know, nice to me, for example. Or I'm going to give you this gift and there was an understanding of some something being returned back. If that doesn't happen, Umar bin Khattab said, you can take back your gift. Now, let me be clear. Of course, this is su. This is an evil thing to do. Or it is not the best behavior, let's say, for a relative or even for a father or anyone to take back a gift. But it is allowed. It is makruh. It is disliked. It is not from the character of the Prophet ﷺ. But because of circumstances, situations, you gave someone something and you're in desperate need, you can take it back if you're the father, for example. Okay, And so... Or, or, or there was an understanding between two people that I'll give you my car if you give me your motorcycle, but the motorcycle doesn't work, so please give me back my car. Right? So, there is the literal understanding of the narration, and then there is the, un, the deeper faqih, the fiqh of the understanding of the narration, which is that it, it is, number one, that you would have to solve the issue of if the qay'ah, the vomit that, that is being discussed is referring to human vomit or a dog. And the strongest narrations are about the dog. So the one who repossesses the gift is like a dog which vomits and then returns its vomit. Okay, And then you have other narrations that don't mention the dog. Okay, They just say that it's like taking back your vomit. Uh, if you take back your gift, which means it makes it sound like it is referring to a human being. Okay? Um, so let me show you one of these uh, narrations. So up till now, all the narrations have mentioned the dog. Okay? And uh, let me see if I can find the narration that does not mention the dog. But one of the chains says, he who takes back his present is like him who swallows his vomit. And so, Al-A'idu fi hibbati kal-A'idi fi qay'i. So, the one who takes back his, his gift is like the one who takes back his vomit. Well, this would be very different in analysis than the one that mentions the dog. So, you would have to first determine which narration is more authentic. Then the second thing is to see, okay, are there other narrations about the same subject? Oh, there are some exceptions. So then that tells you what? Taking back a gift is very, if it was to be done, depending upon the situation, could be a very disgusting behavior, a very makruh behavior, but it's not like drinking alcohol or murdering someone or eating pork or doing magic or doing shirk like the, like the haram mutlaq. Okay. It would be disliked. It would be a sin, possibly. And at other times, the same thing, for example, a father gave his son a screwdriver as a gift. The father sees the son is not using his gift. He says, give me back my gift. I'm going to use it because I need it. Well, then it may not be so bad. So depending upon the situation. So that's the first example that I wanted to share with you about how the literal meanings of something does not add up to its actual understanding. Okay, the second one may be, for some people, even more interesting and more relevant. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ramadan is coming, and so I want to offer uh, all of uh, my subscribers, my listeners, my students, <coughs> a chance to participate in something really amazing. As you know, we have a very 
amazing community where we are. We are in a place where there's about a three to five mile radius of of dominantly Muslims. And particularly in that, Jami Masjid plays a central role, the masjid that we're part of. And of course, we're getting ready for Akhirul Zaman. Uh, and so that doesn't come for free. Um, so let me share with you uh, some of the activities that we've been doing, some of the da'wah work we've been doing. Hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, you will uh, appreciate what we're doing. And then I have something to request from you. So inshallah, this is the opportunity we have. You can turn your $30, $1 a day in Ramadan into $130 because Launch Good is offering us that for anyone who gives us $1 a day, $1 a day in, during the month of Ramadan, they'll make it into $130 for us. So Launch Good is matching $100 for every donor who signs up for their daily Ramadan giving challenge. Just sign up to donate $1 per day to give fun to to our fundraiser and launch good will give us an automatic a hundred dollars there's no uh you know catch so you go to the link that'll be on the comment section or the description which will be launchgood.com slash team jammy buffalo okay and then you press on the white button which i'm going to show you and you sign in uh, the amount it literally takes two minutes to do the whole process and that's it your $30 donation will net us an extra hundred dollars so you're getting a lot more because you're helping uh, us get the re uh, the the finance in this world but you will reap the benefit in this world as well as the next world now let me just show you this is the launch good website uh, when you click on our link it'll take you to this page Okay, and over here, you can kind of see the uh, people that just signed up. Okay, these are some of the people uh, that just signed up. 359 joined today, alhamdulillah. Uh, we're competing against some of the bigger organizations and some of the bigger well-known speakers. But you can schedule your giving by clicking on this white uh, area here. And you can put set your amount for $1 for every... $30, it's going to be $130. You can bring this down to $1 a day during the month of Ramadan. Okay. And you click next. And uh, <clears throat> and so please definitely do that. Okay. So please do that. The other thing I want to say is that uh, we're a very active community. If you are someone who's serious, has a family, who's worried about Akhirul Zaman, 
and wants a to be in a masjid that's strong in da'wah, strong on helping the youth, as you saw from the video. If you're someone who wants to be a, in a place where you can study the deen on a daily basis, if you want to be in a place that's getting ready for akhiru zaman, then definitely consider moving to our community in Buffalo. <coughs> so, with that, I will end. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. By the way, one of the narrators of this narration is Abu Huraira, okay? And this narration that we're reading right now is by An-Nafi' an Ibn Umar. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, idha walaga al-kalb, when the dog licks fi anaya ahadikum in the vessels of any of you, fayagsilhu sab'a marat, let him wash it seven times. So the Prophet said, if a dog licks a vessel, then let him wash it seven times. So what does it mean? If there is a vessel, a dog comes inside the house, because in the olden days, doors weren't always, so the dog runs inside the house, licks the the remaining food, and then runs out. Okay, now you saw this happen, you need to wash the vessel. Okay, so now the vessel needs to be cleaned. Uh, how will you clean it? Well, you need to clean it seven times. That's what the text says. But, like I said, who is one of the narrators of this? One of the narrators of this narration is, if you see, the narrator here is Ibn Umar. And if you look over here, the narrator is Abu Huraira radiallahu anh. And he says the exact same thing. He's another companion relating the same narration. If a dog licks the vessel of any of you, let him wash it seven times. The first time with dust. Okay? <coughs> so the Prophet says, if a, if a dog licks the vessel أحدكم, of any of you, فَيَغْسِلْهُ let him wash it marat, seven times. And let the first of it be بِالتُرَاب, with dust. Okay? Like dry sand. Okay? Dust. So, and who's the narrator? Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh. But guess what? Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh, himself, he's the one who's narrating the tradition. And he himself, when he saw a dog lick a vessel, how many times did he watch it? He didn't wash it seven times. He washed it three times. So if you are just reading the book, you're not going to get the understanding of the predecessor scholars. And so the predecessor scholars, they said, wait, how come Abu Hurairah is the one that is narrating this hadith and he's the one who washes the vessel three times and not seven times? So, now let me mention this again. I'm going to just read from here, uh, from the book entitled Fiqhul Ibadat. The Hanafi school reads, if the impurity is impurity of a dog, it should be washed seven times. And it is desirable for one of them to be with soil. As Abu Hurairah said, the Prophet said, وسلم, to purify one of the receptacles of which a dog has licked inside, one should wash it seven times and the first of it should be with soil. The Hadith mentions that it is recommended, not obligatory, as it was narrated by the Prophet was asked about the dog that drinks from a receptacle and he said, wash it three times, five times, and seven times. Abu Hurairah said, if a dog licks something, wash it three times. So how did Abu Hurairah, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, understand the narration of the Prophet, wash it seven times? He, he understood it that it's the Prophet is saying, let you wash it seven times, meaning it's recommended but it's not mandatory. The mandatory minimum, Abu Hurairah himself practiced three times. And so the Hanafi stance is the minimum is three times, the recommended is seven times, but you would not get this understanding from simply what? Reading the text. Why do I say this? I say this because there are many people that pick up Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawud and Tirmizi and the books of Hadith and then they think that they got the understanding that they're supposed to get. Wrong. Not at all. Not by far. 
Not by far. And then people think, oh, but the hadith says this, and you're saying this. How can there be a contradiction? How can you contradict with the Prophet? Who loved the Prophet more than Abu Hurairah radiallahu? But his understanding of what, because the, the words are not 3D picture. They're not a 3D picture. So Abu Huraira is giving us the 3D picture. Is giving us the full picture. Which is that this hadith is not a command, it is a recommendation. The minimum to wash to an impurity in, in the fiqh of Abu Hanifa, for example, is three times. So, why is this important? There are people out there that will tell you what the hadith means and says as if they, they have read all the books of hadith when they can't even mention some of the most important books of hadith by name. Right? They, they've they only read Bukhari or Muslim or parts of Bukhari and Muslim and they think they understand, have the whole understanding of the Islamic uh, jurisprudence. They don't have the traditional understanding. They don't have the traditional training. They've never looked at the original books. They've never looked at the original original copies that were written by our scholars. Only the modern day, you know, pages, maybe they've seen some of them. And even that nowadays, mostly you would see online, which is then sometimes changed and tampered with sometimes even from the original text that is actually there. And so people talk like they've touched and smelled and looked at the copies, the original writings from Hyderabad and other places where Hyderabad Dakkan, where they used to re write many of these uh, books of hadith, right? So people can't na name the books, forget about telling you what the meaning of the hadith is. And this is just to show you the difference between if you read a tradition of the Prophet and it doesn't make sense, then just know that the tradition or the scholars of Islam may not understand it from the perspective of what it's trying to say in the text. The actual understanding might be quite actually different, like in these two cases. In the first case, yes, it is disliked to take back a gift, but in dire circumstances or if you're a relative or if the understanding between two people is not met, then you can take it. Otherwise, it's makruh, makruh tahrimi or makruh tahlili, depending upon the situation. Over here, you have a dog that licks from the di dishes. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet says, wash it seven times. Yes, you should wash it seven times, but it's okay to wash it three times. Okay, so that's the minimum requirement to remove an impurity is to wash it three times, as the narration of the Prophet ﷺ mentions in general. That if there's an impurity, wash it three times, five times or seven times. So I hope this gives uh, my beloved brothers and sisters an understanding that what that what you read is not necessarily the actual understanding. And unless you go through this process of many, 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 many traditions of looking at, okay, this is the this is the lahir of the text, this is the actual fiqh of the text, this is the actual meaning of the text. When you go through many, then you get trained to look through look at the narrations from that perspective. And you're looking beyond the text, the literal meaning. And this is what is what it means to be a scholar. Otherwise, what is there to, a big deal about being a scholar? What is a big deal about you read, you just pick up the book and read it and anyone can understand it without a teacher? There's no training needed. The way sometimes people treat the subject of hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. So, <coughs> I think this is, will suffice inshallah ta'ala. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.